Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, Senator. The time for convening has arrived. The Senate will come to order. At this time, I will ask all unauthorized personnel to exit the chamber. All senators who have bills and resolutions to introduce, please bring them to the secretary's desk. I recognize the senator from the 28th, my good friend from Coweta County. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Mr. President, and welcome back. It's so good to see you. Just want you to know how much we missed you, and I know how much you missed us. So mm -hmm. thank you for Absolutely. having us here today. Now, my good friend from the 8th wanted me to point out today is a very special day other than being the first day of session. Uh huh. Today is the birthday of a gentleman who was the son of a Mississippi sharecropper. Oh, the and king. And he was the greatest solo recording artist of all time, according to the senator from the 8th. Elvis Today Presley. is the birthday of Elvis Presley. Ah, so, okay. All right. All right. And according to the senator from the 8th, Elvis had a little slogan, and it was on his airplane, a little logo, a little TCB. Taking care of business. Taking care of business. Absolutely. So on the first day of session, I think it's a good day to honor the king, Elvis Presley, because we're going to start taking care of business for the next 40 legislative days. I like it. I like it. Well, now, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, too, it's also great to be back and have our pages back with us. We were here during special session, and, and I missed our pages, and we're glad to have, uh, we've got four, four, right, four great pages here today. We've got Yoshi Lee. We've got Sky Odoron. We've got Blake Reynolds and Stockton White. So y'all give our pages a round of applause. All right. Thank you all for being here. Look forward to working with you today. Thank you, Senator. Mr. President, there is no journal, so I didn't read it. So you, uh, but you I'm sure it would have been correct had we had one. No, there is no journal today, but I will tell you this about the Senator from the 8th, and I might want you to take a point of personal privilege. There was a over the, Christmas, over the Christmas holidays, we have a local radio station, and we always have a Elvis Christmas Day special that my sister has been sponsoring on the local radio program for quite some time. And, uh, and I, uh, she, she asked me to be on, and I said, well, that's fine, but the, person, the only person I know who, know who is a historian on Elvis Presley is uh, our good friend from Valdosta, Georgia, uh, our senator from the 8th. And, and right now, I'm still getting requests from local folks there about what, when am I going to bring that man back to town because he was one of the most entertaining people we, they had listened to. Some even thought he was a comedian on, on the radio show. So, Senator, will you come in? There's a great quote that you always give, uh, Elvis Presley quote that you give that he, he says before, and you do it in his voice, and, and uh, come on up here and, and share that with the Senate real quick. Uh -huh. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Happy birthday, Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley used to have a song called Walk a Mile in My Shoes, and of course, he was a great humanitarian. He, he uh, pretty much gave away everything that he ever made. But before he sang that song, Walk a Mile in My Shoes, he recited a, uh, a poem, and I think it's kind of fitting for just life in general and how we need to treat each other, and it goes like this. You never stood in that man's shoes or saw, thing through to, or saw things through his eyes or stood and watched with helpless hands while a heart inside him dies. So help your brother along the way no matter where he starts for the same God that made you made him too. These men were broken hearts. I'd like to sing a song along the same line. God bless y'all. <laughs> Good job, Senator. I, and that was not that was not rehearsed. I just put him on the spot, so that's pretty good. 
But uh, it's good to have, uh, it's good to be, have all the uh, uh, spouses, and I see some children and everything else that are here today. I've got my crew here today. I've got uh, Jan, and y'all stand up and take a Jan and Banks and Stella here. I tell you, so I, I looked at a picture from a year ago today, and, uh, and uh, it's hard to believe in one year how much the kids have grown. But uh, at any rate, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm glad they're here. And, uh, and as you all well know, it, uh, it takes a family effort to uh, be in public service, and, and, uh, and we, we're grateful. I know everyone in this room is grateful as I am of, of, our fa of my family. So uh, anyways, uh, we are... Uh, glad to be here today, and uh, the secretary. We oh, we've got the JQC appointments. That's right. So, secretary will read the uh, communications of the Supreme Court requesting Senate confirmation of its appointment to the Judicial Qualifications Committee. Secretary, Mr. President. The Senate has received communications from the Governor, Speaker, and House of Representatives and Supreme Court of Georgia requesting that the Senate confirm the following appointments to the Judicial Qualifications Commission. Ms. Victoria Darisol. A copy of these communications have been placed on each Senator's desk. That completes the order, Mr. President. Pursuant to the Senate rules of 33.1, the appointment is referred to the Committee on Assignments. It is now time for the morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? Senator from the 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning and happy New Year's, y'all. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 38th for business outside the Capitol. Without objection, Senator from 38th is excused. Is there any other motions to excuse? Hearing none, the secretary will start the roll calls, signify your presence by voting the A switch. Secretary. <laughs> It is now time for the morning devotion. All senators will take their seats and all audible conversation will, will cease and the doorkeeper will secure the chamber. I've got the, uh, the, the pleasure today of uh, having our senator here today. I mean, having our pastor of the day today, but, um, and I wanna tell you a little bit more about him uh, right after our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. So let me lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Georgia flag. Today it is an honor. I've got uh, Pastor. Derek McClendon here with me today, and he's, as you will be able to see, he's also a, a member of the law enforcement there in Clayton County and has been for quite some time. He and I crossed paths this past year and something that, uh, that he and I both are very passionate about, and that is in youth football. Uh, his son, uh, Caleb, who's here with us today, 
was, was on the team. And of course, my little boy Banks uh, were on the fifth and sixth grade team there at Strong Rock. And uh, I told uh, somebody that, uh, the, that, uh, that I would help coach, but they were going to have to find him a head coach. I couldn't do, because I couldn't deal with mamas and daddies talking about little Johnny not playing, so I needed a head coach. Well, they recruited uh, uh, Coach McClendon, and we got to know one another. And, and, uh, and I, uh, you know, usually when, when a, a gentleman comes in there and, and their, their child is on the team, uh, sometimes you get accused of doing daddy ball, you know, as, as Jan would tell me often. She goes, don't be a daddy ball coach, you know. But uh, I saw real quick that uh, 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 Coach McClendon uh, kind of well, had a lot of philosophies like me when it comes to raising their children, and, and, uh, and he didn't cut his any, more, any breaks that he wouldn't, he wouldn't. He was treating his kids just like he was treating everybody else, you know, and, and, and just like I always do. But we, we grew, we really born, uh, uh, started a real tight friendship there. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then I found out he was a pastor of a church there in Henry County and, uh, and has a great, great following. He is somebody that I have a lot of respect for and, uh, and, and he, he and I had a lot of fun uh, this past football season coaching our, our, these, these young gentlemen. Uh, that they were trying now at times. See, I will tell you that. I hadn't, I hadn't coached football in a long time, especially youth league, and, and uh, it's, it's, a different, it's a different caliber of kid out there right now. But my wife was excited that I had a preacher coaching alongside of me because she said, well, at least I know you won't be dropping any language. You don't need to be around those kids. So I was like, yeah, you're probably right. So, but we had a lot of fun and, and won, some, won, won a lot of games. But more better than that, we, we built close bonds, not just with the kids, but, uh, but also the coaches that we were able to, to work with. And I'm, I'm honored to have him here today. I'm honored to have he, his wife and his son here today. And, and, um, and uh, look forward, and I hope you'll pay close attention to the message that he has for us today. Welcome to 2024 Georgia. I'm going to say that one more time. He said I'm a pastor. You see the police uniform. I'm going to try that one more time. I say welcome to 2024 Georgia. I preached a message two weeks ago called Release the Baggage. Whatever you did in 2023 is gone. It's now time to start over and new beginnings. Is that all right? Giving honor to God who's the head of my life, to my lovely wife, Ms. Patrice McClendon. I brought some guests with me, Lieutenant Jones. I brought Dr. Walker, my chief of police, uh, my supervisor, Lieutenant David Pajures, and our esteemed board president, Ms. Jessie Goree. I'll be about, won't be long, I'll be about five minutes strong. Is that all right? Like Lieutenant Jones said, I met him and we just bonded. And one thing about Kendrick's spirits, we have so much in common. And I call him now my brother from another mother. He's been honest with me, loves my son, loves a coach, loves children, but most of all, he loves God. And all our conversations were based on that. And when I got the invitation to do this, God said, tell the state of Georgia these words. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. And it reads, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then we will heal from heaven. And he will forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. Georgia, all we have to do is humble ourselves. Let us be the light that shines out of darkness. We're in a dark hour in this country now. Wars, rumors of wars. Things are taking place that we thought we would never see. But one thing I know about this state, this is a praying state. And that's why we can come together. No matter what you believe, one accord, one state. Let us pray. Father, we thank you right now. We lift you up, God. We magnify you and we make you bigger than anything. Lord, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. Lord, I come asking as your servant.
to forgive us for our sins, seen and unseen, by omission or commission, God. Blot out our transgressions. Hide us behind your cross. Every county, every city that's represented right now, God, we present them to you, God. We ask you to turn what's going on in this world, Lord. Let us turn back to you. Lord, I lift up, God, the governor of this state. Look on him right now, God. Touch his family. Lord, look on the lieutenant governor, God, Burt Jones. Look on this family, God. Give these men the mind of the learning, the tongue of the intellect to lead this state, God. Touch everyone under the sound of my voice, God. Now, God, you be true. You be humble. We thank you right now, God, for what you're going to do and what you have done. God, I'm asking you to go to every hospital. Go to every corner. Touch those that are bound by habits. Touch the homeless, the sick and shut in. Touch those children, God, right now that don't have anyone. Go to the mental health center, God. Touch right now like never before. Lord, we bless you and we thank you. We thank you right now, God, for what you're going to do. According to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5, 6, and 7. We trust in you, God, with all our heart. We won't lean to our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge you. And you said this word, God. You shall. Shall is a promise. You shall direct our paths. We thank you right now, God. We give you the glory, certainly the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. Amen. Amen, amen again. Lieutenant Burt Jones, it's been an honor and a privilege. I thank you. I thank you. You've been nothing but honest and fair to me and my family. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
It's uh, always a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to visit and introduce our doctor of the day. We greatly appreciate uh, all the work that the uh, physicians that volunteer their time to come down here. And, and, uh, and the gentleman we have today, I'm going to let the senator from the 32nd introduce him, uh, Dr. Kaufman. This marks his 35th year coming down here, 35th year coming down here. That's really amazing. I told him he looks too young to be able to do this for 35 years, but uh, I'm going to call on the senator from the 32nd. Thank you, Governor. I hope that you all will pay close attention to this introduction because it's not often that I get to introduce somebody really special as Doctor of the Day and a good friend of mine for many years. Dr. Bobby Kaufman, Robert Kaufman, we call him Bobby, uh, since 1989, he's been practicing internal medicine at the Kaufman Clinic with offices in Atlanta and Woodstock. He's a graduate of UGA and earned his medical degree at Morehouse, and he completed his residency at Emory School of Medicine. His father, Dr. James Kaufman, started the Doctor of the Day program here in Georgia. So we owe the Kaufman family a great debt. Dr. Kaufman is, has a vast experience with weight loss and fitness, which is a good thing to talk about here in early January when many of us are starting our uh, healthy resolutions. At age 19, he weighed 270 pounds, and by age 21, he weighed 185 pounds. As of 2021, he still weighs 185 pounds, and he's a big believer in daily aerobic exercise and core weight training. So we're going to have to figure out a plan here, people. Uh, Dr. Kaufman's a lifelong resident of Atlanta where he resides with his wife and twins. He's very involved with the Georgia Alzheimer's Association as founder and Atlanta board member. Since 1999, he's been chair of the jo James A. Kaufman Golf Tournament, which has raised over $4 million for the Georgia Alzheimer's Foundation. So knowing that this is Dr. Kaufman's 35th year of serving as Doctor of the Day, I hope that you will all take the opportunity to meet him. He's a huge advocate for what we do down here and is very engaged in our process. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, yes, this is my 35th year, um, but I've only been here 34 years because last year I was in Los Angeles uh, at the National Championship game. So it was uh, much, well, uh, it was a great time. I wish I was in Houston right now, but unfortunately that's not the case. But over 35 years, I've been through a lot down here, made a lot of great friends and have thoroughly enjoyed it. And the service that we provide is, somebody asked me today, have you had some um, cases that are down here? And I was just remember looking up at the stairs. We had one year we had somebody fall and was lodged in up the stair up there that we had to get out. But I truly enjoy being here. I had a great role model in my father. And I'm going to correct Kay that um, we're now up to five and a half million dollars that we've raised for the Alzheimer's research. And so we. I have a lot of very generous friends. But um, as you all know that the role we provide, and that's what we're here for, but there's really one person that's much more important than the doctor of the day. It's uh, Julia Mack over there the, who runs the station, knows everybody. So she's the one who deserves all the credit because she does all the hard work. Julia, wave at everybody. But again, if I can be of any service, my office is just a mile away, and I'm happy to help anybody anytime. Y'all have a great day.
At this time, the secretary has a resolution uh, that they would like to introduce to the chamber, SR 431. Secretary. Senate Resolution 430 by Senators Kennedy of the 18th and others. A resolution to notify the House of Representatives that the Senate has convened and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Does the pro tem wish to speak to the resolution? Pro tem has waived. And does the senator, uh, any objection to the resolution? Chair hears none. And the question on the SR 431, uh, if there's no objections, will be adopted. We have another resolution. At this time, I appoint the following senators as the committee of notification. Sorry, secretary, read the resolution. Senate Resolution 431, a resolution by Senators Kennedy of the 18th and others, a resolution to notify the governor that the General Assembly has convened and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. At this time, I appoint the following without objection. Is there objection to the resolutions? I'm sorry. No. With no objection. I knew y'all were going to be in a friendly mood today. That's why I was trying to jump ahead here. So with no objections, the resolutions are adopted. This time, I um, the point the following senators, Senator from the 18th, the pro tem, Senator from the 51st, Senator from the 55th, Senator from the 50th, Senator from the 3rd, and Senator from the 15th, the Dean of the Senate. I would ask that all members of the committee meet the Secretary of the Senate at his desk immediately upon adjournment. Is there any unanimous consent? Chair hears none. We now time for any points of personal privilege. Would anyone like, like to stand for a point of personal privilege? My good friend, the Senator from the 14th, I hope, I hope you have a, a strong message for us today. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. I have remarked with a couple of you already today that it's fun to be back in some respect. It is certainly an experience that brings a lot of cortisol uh, to be in this building, uh, to use a scientific term, stressful. But we are here, and we're here to do the people's work. I rise today to talk about the people's work uh, and in the context of the swatting incidents that occurred over the last few weeks, over the holidays, against uh, not just the Lieutenant Governor, the President of this chamber, but also uh, several members of this body. We live in a really dark time and everybody knows that. We go about our business in this room as though it is not as dark as it is sometimes. Because we have routines and we work on the legislation we work on and we hope some of this noise dies down. But make no mistake, there are people out there who would seek to use some of the scariest, most dangerous possible tools, threats, not only to put members of the government serious risk of serious bodily harm, potentially worse, but to try to disrupt the normal operation of government. And make no mistake about who condemns these horrific and unjustifiable acts. Every member of this chamber, people of both parties. I've had a lot of good conversations with members of both parties after these incidents and the thing that those conversations have brought forth for me is the idea that the rational, level-headed, stately way to handle these things 
is to condemn them to make sure we have the information to go get the information, provide law enforcement with the tools they need to track down the folks who did this and hold them accountable. The answer is not to run to partisan corners of either side. And I've seen people on both sides make this mistake of assuming that they know everything about who did this and who's responsible. I think that we face a real challenge moving forward with this session in an election year where the risk of culture war is at its highest. And that is when it comes to the very basics of government, are we going to do what's necessary not just to protect our members from a law enforcement, a public safety perspective, and protect the public at large, but are we going to protect our shared commitment to govern for everybody and not assume the worst of each other at some of the most difficult, vulnerable moments that we face? I'm honored to serve with everybody in here. I want to extend again my sympathies to the folks who had to deal with the worst part of this, the stress of having your family open the door and not know why a police response was there or yourself. Um, this is not just a problem affecting legislators, it affects a lot of people in the community, but uh, it's with that shared sense of empathy and solidarity with one another, bipartisan, uh, that I trust that we are going to move forward this session uh, with a commitment to do the right thing, protect everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 39th, will you wish to rise for a point of personal privilege? Good morning and thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, I rise today with a deep sense of pride and honor to acknowledge a pivotal moment in the history of Atlanta, our great city. Today marks the 50th anniversary of Maynard Jackson's historic election as the first black mayor of Atlanta. In just a few minutes over in City Hall, they will also be doing a celebration of this. But I wanted to say here that Maynard Jackson's legacy is not just merely a chapter in Atlanta's history. It is a testament to the enduring power of leadership and the profound impact one individual can have on a community. His vision and determination laid a foundation that continues to shape our city to this day. As we reflect on Mayor Jackson's tenure, we're reminded of the transformative leadership he exemplified. He championed inclusivity, breaking barriers to ensure that all Atlantans had a seat at the table. His commitment to diversity and economic equality left an indelible mark, creating opportunities that persist in our city's fabric. His foresight and strategic governance set the stage for Atlanta's growth and prosperity. His emphasis on building a strong economic foundation, investing in infrastructure, and fostering a sense of community pride has reverberated through the decades. We stand on the shoulders of the progress he initiated, benefiting from the vibrant and thriving Atlanta we know today. Notably, Maynard Jackson's leadership opened doors for subsequent generations, paving the way for the election of Atlanta's first black female mayor, Shirley Frank Franklin, and a continued legacy of engaged leadership in our city seen today with Mayor Andre Dickens. His impact remains evident in the milestones we celebrate and the progress we continue to achieve. So as we commemorate this significant anniversary, let us not only honor the memory of Mayor Manor Jackson, but also recommit ourselves as we begin our 2024 session to the principles he championed. Let his legacy serve as a guiding light, inspiring us to build on the foundation he laid and to continue the work of creating a city and dare I say, a state that is inclusive, equitable, and prosperous for all. May the spirit of Maynard Jackson's leadership continue to inspire us as we work together for the betterment of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and all of its residents. Thank you. I yield the well. Does Senator from 56, you like their eyes on a point of personal privilege?
Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, commend the for Senator from the 14th for uh, talking about the issues that several of us faced at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I think first was our Senator from the 45th, the 32nd, myself, the Senator from the 41st, our Lieutenant Governor, uh, several other department heads were all swatted. And for those that don't understand what swatting means, let me take a moment to explain that. As when someone thinks they're making a prank telephone call and saying someone has been either shot or murdered, and they might be then holding some type of hostages, hanging up the phone trying to solicit the police department to literally send a SWAT team and a cadre of other public safety vehicles to your house. This is extraordinarily dangerous, first and foremost, for the people who are responding as they are driving full emergency in police cars, fire engines, ambulances, etc. It's very dangerous to the public as they are going through the streets, and it's very dangerous to the individuals who are in their home when that happens, not knowing what the outcome could be. This literally could have cost someone their life. And for those who think that this is a prank, it's actually a crime. I want to thank the Senator from the 45th for leading the way on upcoming legislation that you will see that will add criminal and civil penalties on top of what already exists today. And I want to give a special thanks to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the Georgia State Police and Capitol Police for their work in working with our local and federal counterparts in order to track down and bring those people to justice. You may also know that just a few days ago, someone emailed a bomb threat into our Capitol building as well as buildings throughout the entire United States. Again, these type of actions are both foolish and dangerous. You see a much increased police presence here at the Capitol today, and you'll continue to see that both visibly and non-visibly to make sure that each one of you and your families and your staff are protected. Thank you for your service and know that the men and women who serve us in law enforcement uh, our finest are diligently working to bring people to justice. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Senator from 31st, which arrives on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to be brief. I just wanted to um, just share some uh, comments and just uh, let uh, the family of Scotty Tillery in Cedartown, Georgia, know that we're thinking about them. We just had the funeral for Scotty Tillery on Friday, um, and it's pretty hard, pretty emotional. Um, I do want to recognize our senator from the 19th, who's cousin's family of um, this man who was born in Rome, Georgia. Um, who's had a tremendous impact for basically a generation or more on Polk County, Georgia, and Cedartown, served as a city commissioner for a number of years and um, as a county commissioner. Um, so I just want to lift up Anne Marie, his wife, his sons, his brother Rocky, um, and the entire Cedartown community as they continue to grieve um, this man that was bigger than life and bigger than many of us probably would experience in a lifetime. Um, and beyond a generation um, as a Georgian. So, Scotty, thank you for everything you've done for me as an individual and my family, and um, we love the Tilleries. With that, Mr. President, I yield. Thank you, Senator. Senator from 36, point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, colleagues. It's uh, great to see all of us back together, and uh, our numbers are strong and staunch, and uh, let us all come together to work to do the right thing. I wanted to follow the comments of uh, uh, the gentleman from the 14th, uh, as well as the gentleman from the 56th, and others. Um, we've all heard the old adage about the, the lobster doesn't know what's happening because the water heats up so slow and then all of a sudden your 
boiled as a lobster. I think that the climate that we're in in, in, in this state and in this nation uh, is uh, dangerously like a pot of water with a lot of heat under it. If it hadn't got up all the way to 212 yet where it's gonna spill over. But we are on the way and we all understand the phenomenon of behaviors that occur and start to appear normal. I've thought several times over these last weeks as colleagues, uh, no matter their party affiliation, no matter their title or non-title, but uh, open the door to uh, armed police who've been summoned out to, to your home as, a, as an harassment. And the level of security that we just come to count on increasingly, uh, that everything's, you've got to be on guard constantly. You, you've, got to, you, you've got to really worry who can get a hold of your address or who knows where your child goes to school. Remember, this is not normal. We didn't used to live like this, did we? We all know this is not normal. But as it continues, it becomes the new normal. And, and, and I, I think it calls on all of us to do all within our power to use our bully pulpit, party aside. And we know there are folks that'll listen to Senator Orrock, there are folks that'll listen to Oh, Senator Burns, I could run the list. We all have people that listen to us. We should absolutely come together and use the bully pulpit to model behavior that is not divisive, not rancorous, uh, not tearing down, but sounding the message of coming together to address the needs of our constituents and our state is what we need to be doing and playing not at all into this scenario that, well, we're just gonna have to put more cops everywhere all the time. We're gonna have to arm half the state, if not more, on and on and on. We come in the wake of that uh, comes just more negativity and more potential for harm. So uh, let's not let this this, this violence and this, this, uh, and we know that we have people in very high profile positions in the politics of this nation that behave that way and their behavior encourages others. Oh, he can do it, well I can do it too. I can get up and cuss out people in the school board meeting. They're even passing bills to say the parents can do that, you know, without much, without much uh, uh, blowback on them. So, I just urge us all to think deeply about the role that we can, that we should, that we must play in promoting coming together to solve problems and make progress together and to stand in the face of and put a stop to these new dangerous norms that we see taking over our state and our country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 8th, would you like to rise on a point of personal privilege? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in light of, along the lines of uh, what the Senator from, I can't remember what district you're in, uh, 36, um, where we're at today and, and, and the world that we're living in, you know, I don't know if our politics have become a reflection of the people or if our people are a reflection of the politics. But uh, we talked about Elvis Presley, the late great Elvis Presley, um, earlier today, and uh, had an opportunity to do that radio show with the Lieutenant Governor. It was awesome, had the best time in the world. And there's a song I didn't realize really that the Lieutenant Governor was a, a bit of an Elvis fan himself, and in fact, when he uh, when he got married, the mother, the mother and, and son dance that they had was to a song called If I Can Dream by Elvis Presley. Now y'all know Elvis was born in abject poverty. His mother would pick cotton when he was a little boy, when he was an infant, and, and would drag him on the, the burlap sack through the field while he slept. So he got to see abject poverty and the greatest riches in the world. And I, I think about what's going on today. We hear the protesters outside 
and where we're at in terms of you know civility in the country. And I think about 1968, my dad Vietnam 68, but I've always said that my generation's 1968 was 2020. But in 68, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, Elvis's hometown. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. The Vietnam War protests uh, were raging throughout the country. And uh, Elvis was going to do a Christmas special. And um, it could have been the end of his career. He didn't know if it was going to be successful or not. And he wanted, to, he wanted to do a song that spoke to the country. Of course, his manager and everyone else advised him against that. He said, you know, you don't do message songs. You don't want to offend anybody. But he felt so strongly about it that he did it anyway. I hope as we get forward through this, maybe we can the words of these song, uh, this song. But, you know, the lyrics go, there must be lights burning brighter somewhere. Got to be birds flying higher and a sky more blue. If I can dream of a better land where all my brothers walk hand in hand, tell me why, oh why, can't my dreams come true? There must be peace and understanding sometime. Strong winds of promise that will blow away the doubt and fear. If I can dream of a warmer sun where hope keeps shining on everyone, Tell me why, oh why, won't that sun appear? We're lost in a cloud with too much rain. We're trapped in a world that's troubled with pain. But as long as a man has the strength to dream, he can redeem his soul and fly. Deep in my heart, there's a trembling question. Still, I'm sure that the answer, the answer is going to come somehow. Out there in the dark, there's a beckoning candle. And while I can think, while I can talk, while I can stand, while I can walk, while I can dream, please let my dream come true. I think those words were true in 1968 and they're true in 2024. And uh, I, thank, uh, I thank God for the opportunity to serve with all of you. And uh, I hope that we do our part to try to return civility to our public discourse and it's an honor to serve with all of y'all. And God bless you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. S Senator from the 54th, wish to rise on point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, friends, Back during the special session, I had the opportunity to come to the well and thank many of you for your prayers and outreach after the passing of my mother in the summer. And I sincerely meant that. But uh, today I wanted to go to the well because I wanted to tell you a little bit about my mom, Della Ruth Payne. She was an absolute amazing woman. In so many ways, we talk about the greatest generation. I love history because of my mother and a lot of my father's teachings. But we talk about the greatest generation, that generation that had the hope to overcome a depression and then turn around and chase that hope off to war and into the fields and the factories for the first time. But my mother was of the next generation. She was of the silent generation. We don't talk about much about the silent generation. But if you think about the silent generation was the silent generation because they were the obedient generation. They just went out and did the work. And so I just wanted to come to the well and say, teach you, a, show you a lesson of my mother. And every time I leave the house when I was 16 or 17 years old, my mother would meet me at the door. And sometimes I was going to that party I didn't want her to know about. But she'd always meet me at the front door and she'd look me in the eyes like she was looking into the depths of my soul and she'd say, son, you just remember who you are. And I think that that's a message for a state and a nation, that we need to remember who we are as a people. And the, West, the great lesson of my mother's life and what will always live on in, our, in, her, in me and my, in her, my brother and my sister and, my, and her grandkids is my mother, I never in her life, not one time, did she ever come in the room and say, I want. My mother would always say, I hope. 
And I came to realize in life that that hope is what I chased out the door of an airplane 46 times as an Army paratrooper. I left want behind to chase my hope. Hope is why I wiped the spit off my face after a 16-year-old just spit in my face as a probation officer, juvenile probation officer, that I didn't allow myself to be angered because I didn't want. I couldn't let my want have control. My want said rip his head off his shoulders. But hope whispered in my ear and said, yeah, that just happened. But really look at him. And when you really started looking at him, you saw a 16-year-old boy start shrinking down to a 3-year-old just looking up at you and asking you, is there a place in this world for me? Hope. If there's a legacy of my mother, it's that we hope. And I tell people all the time, I said, there's only two places one exists, hell and earth. There's only two places hope exists since Christ, earth and heaven. So my hope for us in this coming section and going forward, that we will govern ourselves by what we hope for and never by what we want for. Because the same message I gave to teenagers for 30 years, your want will eventually lead you down a path you can't crawl out, uh, down in a hole you can't crawl out of. But your hope will never, ever, ever leave you in that state. Thank you, Mr. President, and I will yield the well. Thank you, Senator. And we are sorry for your loss you've experienced this year. Recognize the Senator from the 16th for a point of personal privilege. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I just want to recognize uh, freedom is not free. And uh, the end of December the 29th, we had Officer Mark McIntyre shot and killed in Spalding County. Interesting, he was going to a domestic call and he was shot and killed. I realize this freedom is not free. Somebody stands in the gap for you and me. And our all law enforcement officers stand in that gap for us, and we need to be very appreciative. The scripture says that greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friend. Can I give you this? Our law enforcement officers lay down their life for those who are not their friend. That's even a greater love, in my opinion. He left a wife. He have left children. I think the thing we have to realize is that there's good and evil and no matter how many laws we pass, evil is still present. And that our law enforcement officers are those that stand in the gap between good and evil for you and me. Friday was one of the first times I've been to a ceremony in which they honored a down, an officer that was down. There were over 3,000 law enforcement and people there in honoring Mark McIntyre. The stories behind it were phenomenal because he had an opportunity to, to go into other vocations, but he said, my calling is to be a law enforcement officer. I don't know about you, but that's a high calling in that respect. And he believed that God had called him to that position. I just want to recognize him and his ultimate sacrifice for us and for all those men and women who serve in law enforcement and protect us and are willing to lay down their life. I don't know about you, but as we were here in some of the protests, enough, I don't know about you, but these guys around us, the State Patrol, those that are here, Capitol Police, realizing this, that they are there to stand for us and between us. And I just want to say thank you and also to honor one who was willing to lay down his life in Sergeant Mark McIntyre. Thank you. Senator, do you mind if I ask for the chamber to stand in a moment of silence for both uh, the deputy from Spalding County as well as one from Coweta County here recently? We've had two uh, very, very unfortunate accidents in the last couple of weeks, so everybody stand attention for them. Amen. Thank you, Senator.
Does any other senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Chair hears none when we're moving on. Secretary will read the message from the House of Representatives. The following message was received from the House through Mr. Riley, the clerk thereof. Mr. President, the House has adopted by the requisite constitutional majority the following resolutions of the House. House Resolution 762 by Representative F. Stration of the 104th. A resolution to notify the Senate that the House of Representatives has convened and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary will read the resolution. House Resolution 763, a resolution by Representative F. Stration of the 104th. A resolution calling a joint session of the House of Representatives and the Senate for the purpose of hearing a message from the governor, inviting the justices of the Supreme Court and the judges of the Court of Appeals to be present at the joint session and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the majority leader to speak to the resolution. Thank you, Mr. President. It's good to be back. Welcome back. Happy New Year to everyone. As you all know, the governor has announced that he will deliver his annual State of the State address. It'll be this Thursday. It will begin at 11 a.m. and it will be held in the House chamber. So we've been invited to join them to hear the governor speak about this year's priorities, including the budget and all the other great things that are going on in the state. So we will assemble in this chamber at 10 a.m. as normal and then the president will direct us at the appropriate time to line up in the back and walk over to the, over to the house to uh, join them for that event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Does any other senator wish to speak on the resolution? Chair hears, hearing none. The question is on the adoption of the resolution. All those in favor of the resolution will vote yay, opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machines. The yeas are 54, the nays are zero, and it is now time for me to appoint the escort committee, which will consist of the pro tem from the 18th, the majority leader from the 51st, the minority leader from the 55th, the dean of the Senate from the 15th, the majority whip from the 29th, the minority whip from the 22nd, the floor leader from the 50th, the floor leader from the 3rd, and the senator from the 46th and the senator from the 47th. That will be the escort committee for the governor for the joint session that we will be having on Thursday. We'll just convene, just like the majority leader said, at 10 a.m. Uh, on Thursday and then uh, around probably 11, we will uh, make our way over to the house for, the, for our annual state of the state. You know, Senator, I sat beside you for 10 years, and I, you know, I don't believe there's a committee in this building you shouldn't be on, you know? <laughs> Are there any motions to withdraw or commit? Senator from the 32nd, for what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent that Senate Bill 324 
be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and be committed to the Committee on Children and Families. The, the Senator has moved that uh, bills should be withdrawn from the Judiciary and, and recommitted to the Children and Family, which is the, which is the committee you chair. So, uh, Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 324, a bill by Senator Jackson of the 41st and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 18 of Title 50 of the OCGA relating to state printing and documents, so as to provide for a victim-centered address confidentiality program, to provide for application to such program, to provide for designation of confidential addresses, to provide for certification of program participants, to provide for renewal and cancellation of certifications, to provide for disclosures, to provide for real property records, to provide for training, to provide for related matters, to repeal conflicting laws, and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Senator, I'm, I'm assuming the chair from the judiciary, and, and obviously you agree to That's this correct. move. Without objection, Chair from the 17th, you're, yeah, you can be hard-headed sometimes. You, you agree to this? All right. All right. Well, if there's no objections, uh, we will move that, that, uh, that uh, bill to, uh, from Judiciary to the Senate of Family and Children. Recognize the majority leader for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent that all the bills and resolutions which were placed on the table during the 2023 legislative session be taken from the table at this time. The majority leader has moved. Is there objection to the majority leader's motion? Without objection, Mr. Leader, would you like to speak to the motion? Without objection. That motion is granted, adopted. Recognize the majority leader for another motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent that the bills and the resolutions on the Senate calendar be committed to the committee from which they were last reported. The majority leader has moved that bills and resolutions be committed to the last committee that they were assigned to from last the end of last legislative session. Is there objection to that motion? Without objection, those the motion is adopted. Senator, you don't have your light on, but I understand you want to be recognized from the 21st. Um, parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Uh, Mr. President, on the last day of the 2023 session, you appointed a conference committee on House Bill 514. I was appointed to that committee along with the senators from the 45th and the senator from the 30th. I would note that the senator from the 30th resigned from the Senate last week, leaving a vacancy on this committee. I'd ask that you fill that vacancy so the conferees can continue their work. Secretary, we'll read the caption of House Bill 514. House Bill 514 by Representatives Washburn of the 144th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 66 of Title 36 of the OCGA relating to zoning procedures so as to provide for the length and renewal of certain moratoriums related to zoning decisions, to provide for legislative findings, 
to provide procedures for the levy, collection, use, and waiver of fees relating to zoning decisions and related permits, to revise notice and hearing requirements for certain loaning decisions and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. All right, um, I think I'll, uh, as, as much as I, I've, I've thought about this, Senator from the 26th, for a little bit up here, and, and uh, I, but, but I, the man behind you wanted it a lot worse than you did, so the Senator from the 28th will, will uh, fill that role, the motion that the Senator from the 21st asked for, so, um, but we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep that in mind, Senator from the 26th, don't worry. Recognize the Senator from the 4th, for point of personal privilege or what, what no, purpose you arrive? Sir. Make a motion. Uh, Mr. President, pursuant to Senate Rule 3-1.7, I ask for unanimous consent that Senate Bill 126 be withdrawn. You're asking for unanimous consent to withdraw Senate Bill 126? Okay. Read the caption. Senate Bill 126, a bill by Senator Hickman of the 4th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of Title 10 of the OCGA relating to selling and other trade practices, so as to provide for a limitation on interchange fees charged by payment card networks for credit or debit card transactions at retailers, to provide requirements for payment card networks in relation to such interchange fees, to provide for a civil penalty to provide for definitions, to provide, and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. The Senator has made the motion without objection. Is there objection to that motion first? Without objection, it is adopted. Majority Leader, I recognize you for a motion now. Thank you very much. One down, 39 to go. Mr. Hmm. President, I ask we move to stand adjourned until Tuesday, January the 9th at 10 a.m. You know, it feels like we were just here, though, Senator. I'll be honest with you. Uh, well, Senator from 26 talked it today, man. I like it. I like it. The majority leader has moved that the Senate stand adjourned until Tuesday, January 9th, 2024, at 10 p.m. All those in favor, all those in favor will listen to the announcements first. Here we go. All committee meetings have been canceled for today. That completes the order, Mr. President. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. No. The eyes clearly have it. See you all tomorrow. Have a good day.